that's on. Good, thank you. So they've asked me to introduce Dave. Uh, this is Dave Ward. Give you a little bit of his uh, expertise and background here. Uh, he's worked directly with a number of our larger customers and therefore directly involved in their networks. Uh, at Cisco, he's a Cisco fellow, which is to say someone that, you know, one of our more senior engineers. Uh, he's a senior vice president, which means people actually care what he thinks. And uh, he, he's a, our chief technology and uh, architect, chief, chief technology officer for engineering and our architect, which means that when an SVP yells, please march up the hill, and everybody starts marching up the hill, he stands over here and says, no, that hill. Um, okay, that's the job of a chief technology officer. Uh, but so, so let me, Dave, it's all yours. Hey, thanks, Fred. So uh, as an SVP, Fred pretends to care what I think about. He's actually on my team and uh, all those, thanks, Fred, for the uh, intro. So if you came here for a marketing conversation or hearing all the glories of how Cisco's using OpenStack, um, you're not going to get that. Instead, actually, I wanted to have a conversation with you about not only how we're using this technology, but how we see the trajectory of the technology going as related to trying to deploy, and, and beyond just trying to deploy, actually deploying uh, network function virtualization. So talk to you about you know, how we use OpenStack really, really quickly. And then, uh, frankly, these are my comments, not necessarily Cisco's. You know, my perception, having worked in trying to build products and solutions with OpenStack, where it is, uh, Taking a look at if you want to deploy NFV, what it means, uh, you have to look at much, much more than just some APIs. You need to look at multiple layers of that architecture. And then uh, we'll go into some detail after I lay out the argument, then I'll, then I'll try and discuss with you the logic behind the argument, and then some immediate work that's right in front of us to get this done. So we're all in on OpenStack. We're using it in a number of different uh, products from public clouds to our inner cloud, it's the cornerstone of our uh, NFV solution. And what I want to mention here in particular is that all the rage today is talking about network function virtualization, but the reality is, is that um, virtualizing any, and cloudifying anything that's currently running an appliance is the target that we're aiming at. So the network side of it, I mean, it's a Cisco conversation, we're going to talk about networking, but the applicability of this architecture and the applicability of looking at the whole stack is really towards uh, VXF, where the X can be anything from transcoders to, video, to content ingest, uh, and on and on and on. So the networking side is interesting right now today, but again, the architecture is much larger than that. Um, really, the, the piece that I want to mention is that OpenStack is one of the tools that we use, and we'll discuss the, the larger number of tools that we use to build the solution to, to create the offer. So what are some of these challenges? OpenStack is everything. It's floor wax, it's dessert topping, um, it tr <laughs> it's working on everything uh, that, that seems imaginable uh, to be able to do with cloudifying something. What are the concerns? Look, there's we all know this, and I realize that we're at an OpenStack conference, and so I started off by saying we're all in on OpenStack, but let's also face it, there's a ton of work to do. Constant API churn, there's performance at scale issues, uh, there's synchronization and failure problems with the distributed architecture of how Neutron works, and we'll focus on networking today. Uh, it leads to some HA issues, uh, as well as how to, how to do driver and component design. And uh, the thing to note is that the goal of the architecture that I'm putting forward is to get the right expert expertise in the appropriate niche. And the question that we want to answer or ask ourselves is OpenStack uh, everything? And should OpenStack do everything with, uh, with NFV? Pros are OpenStack is truly open. This is a major community effort, and that's great. Um, and it's a large and growing community, but the cons are that it's frankly got classic feature stability and scale trade-offs in how it works. And uh, have we outstripped the means? And is it fracturing too much? And are we forking too often on parts of this architecture? And forking equals equals bad, because that's the primary challenge that I'm running into, that there are multiple versions and distros of everything, and this is becoming a challenge. But Let's take a look at this whole stack approach. Um, 
really, uh, just a couple of years ago, people just talked about the virtual overlay. And if you could connect, if you could fire up a workload and you could connect them together by any means possible, you've got a cloud. Um, that is not a cloud. That is firing up virtual machines and connecting them together, nothing more, nothing less. And to build network function virtualization, or in particular services out of this, um, there need to be multiple views to be able to operate and deploy these virtual functions into an actual service offering. And you can read these as I'm speaking here, policy view, service, virtual topology, physical topology, and then the resources as to be able to place a service chain or to be able to place these services into a data center, you need to optimize for more than just CPU cycles and memory and, or storage footprint, but you also need to, to understand the capabilities of the devices, how you're going to place them, whether in a hypervisor or a container, and then, of course, what's different about these workloads? They're opti they need to be optimized for I.O. And that's a fundamental difference between uh, NFV workloads or these, type of, uh, these types of workloads versus a traditional enterprise workload. Okay, this is the picture that uh, I'm gonna come back to, but uh, let's fill in a few details. So what's the point of this? The point of NFV is to create a service. That, that's just kind of obvious. Um, to be able, but to be able to create uh, this particular service, we need to take a look at all of those layers and how they in, not only how they interact, but how they actually construct the overall service and are orchestrated to be able to deliver what, what um, people want to use or people need to buy. So this layered model of networking, adding the service layer and the policy layer on top, which is fairly untraditional in most diagrams that you see, you pretty much just see the bare metal, as I mentioned, and then you see the, the physical connectivity between them, for which is a variety of approaches, the virtual overlay for which is a variety of approaches, and often it stops there, as I mentioned. But taking a look at all layers of that stack is key to be able to deploying NFV. So the first piece, looking at the policy layer, is associated with group-based policy, or the way I look at it. it look, it's, a, it's really pretty simple. It's a top-level abstraction where the workloads, which are going to be groups of endpoints, are edges of that particular policy plane. How are they going to relate to, to each other? What are the contracts that one virtual function needs to provide another to create that service chain? Where are the features being deployed, and what are the features that are being deployed? That's all this is really about. Um, and then that policy is, what do we want to have happen? That's the contract nature of this. So group-based group -based policy is one critical extension. And look, the key is to be able to abstract the policy from the underlying hardware or from the layers below, such that wherever these workloads are placed, that policy or those contracts can be adhered to. And so the goal here is not to think of virtual functions as you do as individual endpoints that are to be automated, but instead it's the entire service chain which needs to have contracts between them. If we make the fundamental error and treat a virtual appliance the same way we treat a physical appliance, the same way we treat a physical switch, and we treat them all as singleton endpoints programmed in a serial nature, you're gonna have the same cluster and insert the next word. You can have the same CF that you have right now. And frankly, the way we manage and, and orchestrate networks today is a complete foobar. And it is because we treat everything as a singleton individual endpoint unrelated to anything else around it. That's what group-based policy is trying to solve. The second piece that's being added to this is the notion of the service abstraction or service function chaining. And this is how that service layer, or how that graph, if you want to think of this in networking terms, because that's the way I think of it, which is basically everything is a topology and a graph that's being put together. And a service topology is a directed acyclic graph based upon the flows that are going through those particular nodes. So therefore, what we're trying to accomplish with SFC is that uh, there's a notion of direction, order, and sequence that the traffic is supposed to traverse through the NFV service chain. And that service function chaining is how you create logical linearity through that service chain. So the, the power of what, NS, of what SFC does or of the network service header, NSH, is that it's decoupled from the actual transport. Your addressing any, underneath could be layer two, could be layer three, could be V4, could be V6, but that met that 
service path is decoupled from the transport. It is a notion of metadata. And, and really what we're talking about is being able to measure on that metadata, but of course, notion of a VRF context or the routing table or the, or the tenancy that the service chain is within, notion of user context, et cetera. By doing this, we also move beyond just talking about the network in virtualizing these functions. This is how we can bring in not only network function, network, virtualized network functions, but virtualized any function that we need to do. And what I mean by this, to keep it simple, is that you may need a virtualized network function like a virtual router to be able to accept the traffic, but behind that, of course, maybe another network function like a, like a load balancer, but think of media ingest, think of being able to do transcoding, think of being able to do packaging. Are those really network functions? No, they're in fact media functions that are related to that particular service chain that has to be tied to a network topology. The power of this, of using a contract or a notion of group-based policy to render how that service chain is going to, going to work is a direct reflection of what that business policy or what you're trying to achieve creates. And so, therefore, as you've probably read as I've been, as I've been discussing here, you can attach to the particular flow from either the source or at the ingress point to a particular cloud the context necessary to apply that service, as is stated here. So towards this end, these two concepts we've been working on for, for quite a while. There's a boatload of other players, uh, some of them mentioned here, unfortunately some of them not, that, we've, uh, that I've just forgotten by accident. Um, but nonetheless, I'll mention some of that as I go forward, that we now have this uh, in not only proof of concept pilot, but also in deployment. And that standardization, uh, primarily done at the IETF, in conjunction with how to open source that through open daylight and open stack is the, is the path forward that uh, we see with a number of these players in the industry. So taking a look at some of these pictures, um, really wanted to show you how it fits into the overall OpenStack architecture and how group-based policy fits in. And you can see I've highlighted it here, is that, that when you're taking a look at the different ways of interfacing into OpenStack, and then you're taking a look at the way the drivers map into this, you can see uh, that Open Daylight is taking a uh, critical role in this to be able to render those service chains from group-based policy into service function chains and manage both the overlay uh, and also the underlay that are below those two layers, as I mentioned. So I'm gonna give you a couple of other pictures of, of how this works and kind of walk you through how, how overall these, this system works together there is an orchestration management system that's trying to create that service chain, and that, that's what's seen on top. That provisions uh, the service function chains, provisions the policy, tells uh, the policy to OpenStack of where to place those workloads or those virtualized network functions or virtualized any function. Um, and then uh, those workloads are placed via OpenStack. OpenStack passes that metadata onto Open Daylight, leaving the state of the multiple virtual forwarders, as well as the service function chaining and, and programs the appropriate features as necessary for the group-based policy contracts. And so this particular piece has been, uh, has been proven to work and dramatically reduce state in Neutron, utilize the high availability of open daylight, use the scale-out capabilities of open daylight, but nonetheless have those APIs that folks are currently using with OpenStack be able to create not only, to, sorry, to create this service, which is the ultimate goal of all this infrastructure. And my goal as an engineer is state reduction, improve high availability, create the service chains that re relate directly to business value, and be able to put together things in addition to just network function virtualization for, for multiple industry solutions. What this looks like in open daylight is in fact uh, using the model-driven SAL notion where, in fact, you create a model of the topology, you create a model of the different devices that, that uh, build this out, but the reason why this, is, this also becomes key is not only the fact that Open Daylight can render this, it can speak any SDN protocol currently known to mankind. There's, let's say, 10 today, 
I can guarantee you if I stand here next year, there's going to be 10 more. There's an, if it's not labeled NFV or SDN in networking right now, it's not sexy and you're not going to get attention. Um, but the get out of jail is a controller that speaks everything. So whether it's OpenFlow or it's OVSDB, and remember, OpenStack Neutron on top actually has no idea that it's passing it through this particular plugin. It makes the API calls, it passes the data down to Open Daylight, and we can keep the state, as I mentioned, directly in Open Daylight for the virtual forwarders, and be able to program lifecycle management associated with all of those different features and functions to build out that service. But the keys to being able to do this, you know, there are some keys here in OpenStack, which is uh, some extensions to Neutron, in which we can pass, again, some data through OpenStack down to Open Daylight associated with the port object. And I know there's a number of conversations uh, happening and discussions in, in sessions this week. And then being able to take that, what's in that string, and I'll show you in a second, um, and be able to bind that to the policies associated with group-based policy and the endpoint groups, whether they're what type of device they are, what the associations, associations are, what the order is, et cetera, passing this data down into Open Daylight to be able to orchestrate that chain. And so this, these expressions for different environments actually enable Open Daylight to be a multiple renderer for those service chains and those appliances that, that are being created. Okay, we, we went through that section pretty quickly, so let me put this back into context uh, for those who, who want to understand what I'm trying to get across a little bit better as I did go quickly. What's the point of all this? There's three main things. You need to be able to place the workloads on the appropriate, in the appropriate container hypervisor on the correct uh, devices in the correct location. Second, you want to be able to create policies between these. And this is pretty normal conversation for anybody who's, who's in networking that one forwarding device passes data onto another forwarding device, and there are features that are uh, built, or sorry, are configured and provisioned into those appliances or, or networking nodes which effectively forms this contract, and so that's the policy. And then we want to be able to chain it. So, moving this one step forward, let's connect these dots. We want to be able to, to connect placement to policy such that we can communicate between the groups that are forming, forming that service. We want to be able to link together placement to chaining. So, given that these, these virtual appliances are resident somewhere, define the policies that need to be applied between them and then connect policy to chaining itself to communicate what traffic should go into which service chain. Again, this is all pretty normal from a networking point of view, but these are basically uh, really quite new concepts to, to the NFV world and to the virtual appliance world. The overall goal, make it easier to define this and deploy and operate the services that need to be deployed together. And it's pretty straightforward stuff. Load balancer, firewall, web server, that's a service chain. You want to deploy those at one time. There are features that need to be at each point in that service chain. Make it as simple as possible to render that particular service chain, provision it regardless of where it lands in the data center, and move that policies, move those policies and move that configuration as the endpoints have to move around based upon this, the current status or state of that data center. So realizing this in open source, and we can talk about standards as well, but realizing this in open source, um, OpenStack is great at placing the VNFs, absolutely great at this. But um, the policy piece, the provisioning configuration, has some challenges, and this is where group-based policy comes in again. And then the chaining, uh, this, uh, this has been built into open daylight. And so all these pieces, when you take a look at that architecture, and I'll get to it again in a second to remind you, when you look at the service plane uh, the policy plane, the service plane, the virtual overlay, the virtual underlay, and the resource use, all of these need to come together to be able to deploy that service. So as we connect these dots, um, there are some problems. Some things don't currently exist. That notion of the semantics to communicate EPG membership to workloads is missing right now. Uh, the placement to chaining lacks the semantics to communicate what type of VNF uh, that workload represents. We, can, we know how to fix that. And then the policy to chaining, um, this is upcoming in the lithium release of Open Daylight. So we're right on the verge of, of seeing this architecture come to fruition in completeness in open source. 
To close those gaps, and as I mentioned, I was going to tell you what that metadata looks like, and this is really what we're talking about. If we can pass some of this information along with the port, um, we can indicate whether, you know, what the workload type is and what endpoint group it's a member of. And so this metadata actually ends up becoming uh, quite important on, on how to be able to place the VNFs, identify them, create the service chains, and treat them like a service topology that they are. And so you can see on the placement to chaining, um, you have the ability to say that the VNF is actually a specific type, which then will key up the type of provisioning configuration and policy that's necessary for that particular device in that chain. So these are some of the immediate steps in front of us that we need to work on. So let me show you uh, some architectural pictures. Some of them are familiar, some of them are not. This is, a, this is in fact a Cisco picture where uh, putting that architecture into action, you can build a virtual managed services solution with OpenStack, Open Daylight, with an orchestration on top, as I just mentioned. And in fact, this builds out those service chains um, using this architecture as I described. And the key piece here is that it allows independence of the physical resources, independence of the virtual overlay and addressing semantics, and allows the VNFs to be deployed as a chain and to be referenced as a complete chain or a complete service to both the user or tenant or to the operator so that they can perform service assurance associated with that service for that particular user and tenant and treat the entire service topology or NFV service chain as a whole. Looking at a couple of other pictures, if you're a, a fan of Etsy, this is uh, gonna orient your brain towards an Etsy type diagram. Um, and how the different pieces that I mentioned in the previous diagram fit directly into that Etsy architecture. This is, um, again, this is one way to, to represent it, um, but do note that there is a fundamental difference, which is I'm not having, sorry, we do not create an architecture where there's an independent element management system or management system per VNF. That is done via the orchestration system based on those contracts. I actually believe this is a fundamental flaw of the Etsy architecture. I'm not the first one to say this on stage, but treating each and every virtual machine or, virt or workload or network function, virt virtualized network function, requiring it to have an independent NMS or EMS, I think is, is simply ludicrous. And so instead, that, that deficiency um, uh, is addressed. In OPNFV, they're headed down the same path. They're using all of the same tools, OpenStack, Open Daylight, OVS, KVM, heading towards containers. Um, they're heading towards their first release as well. <clears throat> but the thing that I want to mention here is that the OpenNFV community rose uh, not only as a midstream project, not only from the members originally in the SENFV uh, working group, but also from a fundamental uh, slowness or lack of adoption of some of the blueprints. When telcos, MSOs, service providers are arriving in the community, they're having challenges with their blueprints and their use cases. This is something that this community has to address. There needs to be an outlet. Um, seeing a rise of more and more midstream projects, I think, is not advantageous to the industry. But right now, the midstream project of integrating all of these open source pieces together, I think, is key for this point in internet history uh, to be able to make it work. And um, hopefully it'll be proven out very shortly and then we can move from the use cases that they're trying to build midstream directly into blueprints and it can take off. And there's a variety of communi communities I think that they can uh, continue to catalyze to, to have this outlet. So uh, my next point is that building these architectures in open source as an example, and I give you a quick preview, I hope you read the last line, but in a quick preview of this, the challenge we have is that there isn't one answer for how to do these things. I think for every project and sub-project, regardless of the community, OpenStack um, or OPNFV, if one way of doing it is good, seven ways of doing it is better. And often those seven different ways of doing it are somebody's own distribution and somebody's own way of doing it. And needless to say, this turns into a forking nightmare. And the 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 nemesis of a successful open source community is a forked project. 
And, I, and in this particular case, NFV and deploying these virtualized services is getting very, very challenging because of the seven different options for everything you could possibly do. That requires not just seven times the resources, probably 49 times the resources to get any of this done. And we do need to find a way within our communities to, uh, I don't want to say reduce, but begin to make decisions of which, one, which uh, valuable piece of technology can move forward towards these solutions or we will see a rise of a continual rise of midstream projects trying to integrate these. Um, so stop forking up my NFV. So let's take a look at, at the future and, and what's necessary. So my goal is to take this platform concept or this whole stack architectural concept from policy through service, through the virtual layer, through the physical layer, and through resource management, and take this to multiple industries. Right now, uh, load balancers and NATs are interesting, but do not make an NFV solution. The number of virtual appliances that need to be brought into the fold and can be service chained together for high business value, um, it's taking too long. Um, now, instead of just ranting and riffing up here, I also will mention a few things that we're working on as well. In particular, service assurance has been a complete lagging uh, caboose at the end of this train. Um, it's incredibly challenging to operate. Look, if operating a network is hard to begin with, and a lot of IT pros are saying this is way too complex, automate, simplify, et cetera, et cetera. Without some of these tools that I'm describing, operating an NFV solution is unbelievably challenging. Um, and so, again, passing some of that metadata and passing some of those identifiers of where workloads are placed, where service chains are, how they're connected together, and be able to represent that as a service makes things easier. And that service assurance piece and managing that whole stack is a key focus of where we're headed, uh, both in the Open Daylight community and, and at Cisco. The resource awareness and reservation, uh, this particular piece is really close to a black magic for the industry. There are cloud and data center management tools that allow you to take a look at where workloads are placed and how much CPUs they're using and how much storage and how much RAM. Necessary but not sufficient when you are an I.O. optimized workload. That I.O. piece of what is contributing to, uh, sorry, what is the limiting factor or limiting variable in my deployment of NFV most frequently is I.O. And that isn't part of our overall uh, cloud and data center uh, resource management system yet. So that one, on, that one is key on how to be able to build these service chains and guarantee that you're going to get the service uh, availability and reliability that you need out of it. Security and attestation of this, uh, trust and security is still um, almost in an open loop on a lot of these pieces. There are a number of proprietary solutions that are, that are emerging, but nonetheless, this needs to be brought into the entire architecture and then other architectures of deployment. Um, you know, hypervisors, containers, bare metal, all of it needs to be able to be orchestrated and workloads have to be placed. And, you know, to the OpenStack community, please work, you know, harder and faster because um, we need, we need uh, every form of deployment possible. So my goal of, of building out this architecture is to not only bring attention to uh, what, what we need to be able to deploy at NFV or any virtualized functions, um, but also we need to have the stability and performance and scalability needed to be able to deploy these in a basic distribution. So um, to enable ourselves, uh, I'd say that automation is necessary but not sufficient. Um, we do need this whole stack architecture to be able to deploy ubiquitously and we do need a notion of all of those planes. Policy plane, service plane, uh, virtual overlay, physical, and then the resource management. So I've got a few, uh, few minutes for some questions, comments, or conversation. You know, there's a, there's a mic over here, or I can repeat your question if it's too far for you. Yes, please. Okay, Chris. Uh -huh. Quick questions about the container networking. So if everything goes well, the containerization of the containers is going to be a big thing for the next generation networking and the applications in terms of the NFBs, uh, BNFs. So what's your Cisco's view? What's your Cisco's ideas about 
networking those containers across multiple data center, multiple hosts, et cetera. Okay, so there's, there's really kind of two questions in there. One is, where are we headed with containers? And containers, hypervisors, bare metal, uh, I want to be clear, I, I don't care. I mean, the money, is, sorry, anybody's business function is not based upon how they actually wrap their application, and we need to support them all. I've got no religion on any of this stuff, uh, although it's a fun bar conversation to have religion. Um, the second question you asked is, how do you federate these data centers together? Cl you know, that clearly is also black magic at this particular point with a lot of these deployments. And having geographic redundancy or being able to mo move workloads from one data center to another data center based on proximity or high availability is a key piece. Then the best thing emerging out of this whole stack architecture with respect to group-based policy is that it's not associated with the underlying physical resources. So you can take those policies and contracts and move those workloads to another data center without redeploying new addressing, without reassigning all those variables that has been traditionally necessary when moving network functions around. So the trajectory is there towards data center federation, but this infrastructure, I believe, needs to be in place to be able to have to make it so, and in, and in particular to abstract it above, those, above the hardware itself. I threw a, bu a bunch of contentious comments out in this, in this presentation. I can't believe folks are taking it sitting down. Lou. <laughs> You're taking this sitting down. Go ahead. You can, I'll repeat for you if you like. Hundred percent, hundred percent. In particular, because um, as you know through history, in Neutron there was state held in Neutron. When we added more than one forwarding plug into that, there was now cross state across those plugins. Then the ML2 drivers came in, and there was state associated there. Um, high availability and scaling and consistency and coherency became, frankly, a very very challenging proposition. Obviously, people made it work. They made it work with a ton of effort, and when you step back and just look at, it, look at it architecturally, you'll see, oh, you've got your state distributed around too much, and it's very, very challenging to keep everybody consistent on how it's working. Let's have, a, let's have something that's abstracted and move that state into one location associated with the entire chain. So 100% um, agree that uh, state reduction and having Neutron focus on massive performance and scale and, and clarity and ease of those APIs is, is what I'd recommend and move that state to uh, something that, can ha that speaks any language of networking. I mean, you could kind of see the trajectory that Neutron would be on trying to handle multiple forwarders and the infinite number of drivers that, or plugins that would have to come out of it, each one from potentially a different vendor or multiple open source communities, you know, you know danger ahead. And uh, I think that'd be very challenging. Hey. Excellent point. So, uh, you know, as they say, I'm an old SDO man myself. Uh, in fact, I am. But um, really, the, where, what this is coupled with is with respect to the service models, those are being described in Yang. And Yang, Yang is a modeling uh, format being standardized at the IETF. And working with the IETF in particular, and if you know that body well, you'll know that they distribute out 
all work to all relevant working groups as if they were associated uh, with a particular protocol or feature. And if we want to deploy a tenancy in a layer three VPN or its own IP address pool, that has a extreme likelihood in a distributed nature to take, I don't know, 10 years and maybe 20 years. And I say that because SNMP is in the state that it's in. So um, using, using uh, Yang and, and working with some IETF folks, they're focusing on defining services first, you know, to be able to provide an end-to-end -end service like a layer three VPN, like a layer two VPN, or, or uh, building out these service chains. So Yang is key from a policy point of view. Uh, from a service view and service chaining that's being done at the IETF as well. Um, creating uh, the communication between open daylight and the different uh, virtual forwarders or virtual machines underneath. Like I mentioned, most of the SDN protocols have one standard body or another associated with it, whether it's OpenFlow or it's NetConf Yang or it's path computation element. Uh, I could go on and on. Um, the one that's a bit challenging is OVSDB. And OVSDB really needs uh, something written down. And you know, I'm not, I'm not really a big governance guy, but it would be really nice if something was written down and we could agree on, on some aspect of the trajectory hand in hand with the code that's being developed. One thing about this architecture when it comes to either Yang or the SDN protocols or Open Daylight or NSH or others, the play that we tried to run, if you want to think of it that way, is that it's being standardized in an SDO, in the correct SDO, and again, that could be Etsy, IETF, ITU, IEEE, uh, ONF, on and on, at the same time that the code's being written. One thing I do know from being an old standards guy, and this is going back a while now, is that co standards written at the same time of the code produce superior standards. A committee of people who, after two years, produce a piece of paper that isn't worth the paper that it's printed on, but they really thought hard and succumbed to groupthink and a variety of other ways to fool yourselves into thinking it's a good idea with no code next to it, those tend to be standards that uh, either take a very, very long time to implement or never arrive in the marketplace. So that conjoined nature of open source and open standards are key. So this entire architecture is, is both open source and open standard. Dave, we're going to close the um, questions down now and do our drawing. So if you guys have um, filled out your cards and want to put them in the fishbowl, we're going to do the drawing. And I think Dave might hang out a few minutes outside if you have other questions. So Are we giving away a car? Is this Oprah? We're giving away an <laughs> iPad <laughs> mini. Oh, so I thank you all for your time this morning. Have a great OpenStack Summit, and I'll talk to you soon.